Welcome everyone to the second technical talk for the multi-agent safety hackathon. This time with Christian Sorda de Witt, uh, after the talk with Joe Leiber uh, 15 minutes ago. And we are lucky to have uh, Christian along here, uh, who is a researcher at Oxford. Uh, he is working on foundational AI and information security. Um, and he uh, is also a visiting researcher with Yoshio Bengio at Mila over in Canada. Uh, on, I was about to say in your spare time, but probably in your full time as well. <laughs> So that's perfect. So actually, this just came to an end. So that's no longer. I actually have to update this. Yes. So I was until August, um, and um, yeah. So no, I'm, I'm I'm not anymore. Well, well, it's well. been a great time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if anyone has questions about that, they can ask. Hear what? Hear what's so, happening? Uh, all right. Like one year. One. It was a one year engagement. So it just came to an end naturally. And, uh, mm, yeah. Quite exciting. That's a so, that's a good year. Very given what has happened now. Yes. But uh, I'll uh, I'll leave the stage to you and. Uh, and, uh, and jump off here. Uh, I'll Thank jump you. on if there's any issues with the stream, so you can just assume everything works. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Espen, and thank you so much for inviting me um, to this um, really, really exciting uh, event, um, the uh, uh, AI Safety Hackathon. Um, yeah, so my, my background is I'm a, I'm a postdoc um, at Oxford um, with the first lab for AI research. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, multi-agent security, which is a new field. There's going to be a workshop at NeurIPS about it. Um, and yeah, I don't want to give away too much too soon. So um, maybe just a little bit about myself. Um, so uh, my background is in physics and computer science. Um, I then did a DPhil here at Oxford PhD. Um, focusing on cooperative deep multi-agent reinforcement learning. Um, and over time, um, I have been working with quite a number of different actors, um, ranging from sort of policy actors to um, sort of security uh, actors like a Swiss Cyber Defense um, Department um, or um, the European Council of Foreign Relations. Um, and yeah, there's also the AI for HMS modeling community, which you may know. So we've organized a few top conference workshops um, over over time. So I've sort of sampled um, from a lot of different um, areas, um, which all feature um, different aspects of cooperation. And yes, I'm a proud um, grantee from the uh, Cooperative AI Foundation um, through uh, Professor Jacob First at the moment, so it's funding me. Um, yeah, so um, um, question I want to ask um, at the beginning of this talk is a little bit, um, maybe a little bit provocative, um, and it's sort of asking in how far is cooperation actually about um, sort of decentralized coordination. So what we tend to do when we um, do research on corporations very often, sort of we take some decentralized agents, um, we fix some payout matrix, um, then we solve for equilibria, usually like approximately because we, we are in, in high dimensional state and action spaces, uh, mostly state spaces. Um, and then sort of we can we can dabble in this kind of infinite wonderland of uh, equilibrium selection problems, right? Like there's there's an uh, infinite uh, number of uh, problems we can set up um, at equilibria. We can we can create and characterize, and then we can study uh, the effects of different sort of choices surrounding social welfare. Um, we can also um, just try out different combinations of learning algorithms and so on, and we can just see basically what what happens. And um, I'm asking the question now whether this is um, ultimately really informative about real world cooperation problems. Um, and I, I, I just answer this myself. I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm interested in your opinion. So, so for example. Um, when I look at safety critical um, sort of uh, coordination problems or cooperation problems uh, in the real world, then they're usually resolved through a combination of conventions or standards and, and centralization. So, um, for example, like there's the famous TCA system um, that uh, prevents aircraft from, from colliding and that's um, basically it, it relies on communication between both aircraft and then there's some sort of symmetry breaking where one aircraft is supposed to descend, the other one to climb. And if you um, if, if you have issues with the TCAS system or if um, one of the aircraft is not equipped with it, um, then your backup would be to get some sort of uh, uh, advice from from a flight tower. Um, so again, like it's 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 the centralization um, of this problem. And um, in fact, um, when we think about um, autonomous driving um, or other multi-agent systems in the real world, then we have a lot of um, sort of standard um, creating agencies that have been fortunate to be on the steering committee of one of them, Oceanus. Um, and uh, yeah, so the idea is we ask um, 
uh, manufacturers to adhere to a set of standards and that sort of like creates um, conventions that uh, we follow um, and that's sort of like how we tend to do cooperation in the real world very often. Um, then there's also this issue where this sort of simultaneous coordination problem that we like to study quite a lot um, sort of seems to tend to collapse very quickly in the real world. So here you have an example. This is from Tess AI Day 2021. So it's a fa famous example where like there's an autonomous car at the bottom and then there maybe is a human car. Actually, I'm not quite sure which one is human, which is autonomous. It doesn't really matter, but one, you know, they have like this um, uh, a narrow uh, a piece of street and uh, the cars have to decide which car goes first and so on. And so um, what Tessa seems to be doing is um, they're doing this sort of joint planning problem um, where they're looking at different options that different agents um, could take. Um, and um, the point is just that, so, so it could be you know, that the yellow car waits or that the yellow car goes. It's not clear at this point, but what tends to happen in the real world is usually that um, over time, um, sort of chance or, or um, other sort of asymmetries or whatever um, lead to the simultaneous coordination problem to collapse in the sense that like suddenly one of the cars is like speeding up a little bit and then the other car like kind of gets that hint and it's like, okay, now it's actually much more likely that this car will go or the other car like stops preemptively. So when these simultaneous coordination problems um, happen, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to act on it because very often they are just um, resolved and we usually have time to to um, see what the temporal evolution of the system does before we have to um, uh, act on it. So I think this is kind of an important um, an, an important feature of real world um, coordination or cooperation problems that is often not reflected in sort of um, simple benchmark environments or of matrix games kind of setups. Um, there's also a fundamental problem that decentralized problems are um, can be of very high computational complexity. So learning them end to end can actually be fairly prohibitive. Um, and even multi-agent reinforcement learning cannot beat inherent complexity barriers. Uh, and this sort of prevents um, yeah, scaling to large problems. And um, arguably, it's also behind a lot of pathologies that we see um, and leads to a lack of overall robustness. So um, um, the caveat here is like we don't really know um, enough our complexity barriers are a problem or not. Um, but if you have a given problem, like it could be in a subfamily of, for example, DECPOM DP problems that is not like super exponentially complex, um, but we don't know, right? So um, if you cannot show whether this is how hard this set of problems is, then um, yeah, we, we, also, we also don't have guarantees that that end to end learning, for example, will Will work. So in the real world, um, we often see, particularly if you have like sort of uh, latency constraints and so on, uh, or security or safety critical applications, we often see um, the use of um, heuristics or, or even principal algorithms that have some sort of guarantees, right, to resolve um, coordination problems, um, help with the sort of automated cooperation. So for example, deadlock avoidance in concurrent computing is one of these things um, where um, we even go to great length to create systems where we have provable guarantees on um, yeah, our ability to avoid um, deadlocks. Um, there's also the issue that the real world sort of payout matrices can be rather intractable to construct. Um, and um, I would actually argue um, that um, if we overstate the importance of a given payout matrix or a certain game structure, um, or if we um, take a simple game and we um, overstate the relevance of, of, of whatever um, emergent phenomena um, we find in this game, um, if, if you overstate that too much, then this is, can actually have enormous cost to society. So, for example, um, I've been uh, involved in uh, international um, climate politics, uh, various levels and, and climate policy, um, and um, there's this uh, very interesting paper from 2020 um, that, that's being cited a lot now, um, which is questioning this uh, idea that international climate negotiations are somehow a prisoner's dilemma where country A is not going to do anything until country B does something, right? Like, so you can actually empirically look back at 30 years of international climate negotiations and what you find is much more aligned with um, 
uh, uh, you know, countries uh, basically um, themselves sort of on the domestic level deciding what they're going to do on the international stage relatively uh, independently of other countries. So it's like a so-called, um, you know, um, distributive uh, conflict um, between uh, winners and losers of climate change uh, within each country. And that kind of decides whether factions come to power in this country that will support international climate action or not. Um, the other example that I like to bring is the evolution of cooperation. So um, there's there's a lot of um, indication that um, while um, we indeed get a lot of uh, cooperative sort of equilibrium for uh, um, matrix games uh, that are external sum matrix games that are infinitely repeated or of uncertain uh, repetition horizon. Um, that, that you know we get these national equilibria that um, that are some of which are of competitive nature so that's that's not disputed but what is sort of disputed is the relevance of that to um, cooperation emerging uh, in the real world so even some of the original examples that uh, Axelrod uh, chose for example the trench warfare and so on um, it seems like um, that even like the books he's citing on that are like kind of contradicting um, the idea that cooperation somehow spontaneously emerged um, in a decentralized fashion, but it was rather a product of either agreements that were made between different factions um, or um, decisions that actually did not depend on the actions of the other faction. So yeah, that, that's some of the thing. Then another observation I've made over time is that um, it seems that we always require some sort of or implicitly require but this is not made explicit very often some sort of trusted cooperative infrastructure for any of this um cooperation uh, decentralized cooperation to work so um if you have for example the zero shot coordination setting so who ensures that uh, agents will actually stick to a particular choice of learning algorithm right um or opponent shaping um how do we know what the properties of the other learners are or um, even even how do other players negotiate randomness and so on right like there, there's a lot of or are they rolling the, the, um, their dice uh, the die is the same way or not um, open source game theory for example where I have access to the other agents policy or the code of that the other agent is running um, I'm running into these uh, limits of static analysis right like I can't even say whether the other program is going to hold. I mean, this is an extreme example, but if I assume that the other agent is an autonomous system, then by definition, even if I know the code of the other agents, I don't know what the percepts are that the other agent receives, right? So it's uh, autonomous agents by definition are not very predictable. Um, yeah, and I, I have the feeling that sort of this is not made very explicit, this need for a trusted cooperative infrastructure and how this um, should look like. Okay, then when we come to humans, um, well, it turns out humans are adaptive and can communicate, and that's why we sort of have driving schools, because we can teach humans to follow certain conventions and so on. So if I have um, a game and I want to play it with a human, then um, I could I could just basically focus on teaching the human how to play the game, um, and then after that, play it with the human instead of, um, I don't know, requiring AI agent to um play ad hoc uh, with different humans right um so it's a question of like how how well can this actually work and then also how necessary is this in the real world um and then obviously humans have uh, cognitive limitations um they can vary individually or contextually um but um also things like inattentiveness or, or lack of motivation and so on uh, in the real world are often very important when it comes to human performance um and a lot of there's a lot of uh, theory like a lot of use of theory of mind uh, a lot of buzz about theory using theory of mind for achieving better cooperation but it's it seems unclear how much theory of mind humans actually even normally do right um so it seems very often that humans use uh, cognitive shortcuts to theory of mind rather than actual theory of mind um th humans can do theory of mind of course but whether they do or not it can also be like just a choice they make right so humans can um, uh, choose to to make certain uh, choices um, or not. Um, they can choose to behave rational or not um, in many in many contexts. And um, yeah, so interacting with humans is is, is a complex beast. Um, and after all, humans are also vulnerable, right? So humans um, have um, uh, sensitive attributes that they don't want to share with others. Um, yeah, um, and, and they can get tired and so on. So, so there's a lot of sort of safety and security relevant issues with humans. Um, it's very difficult. Um, so my takeaway is sort of 
for the next five years of cooperative AI research is a bit like, so first of all, recreation of games, maybe they are recreation of precisely because they're unlike daily life. So maybe um, maybe that's refreshing, you know, in a sense. And uh, so maybe um, that explains also why recreation of games might not be the best sort of benchmark environments um, for cooperation research outside of recreation of games. Um, we, uh, there's been a lot of sort of discussion about whether we need human data um, for achieving communicate, uh, cooperation with humans, but um, I think it's pretty clear now that we do need human data and we also need good um, human study design. So we need to collect good human data um, and we need to collect it effectively. And I think um, uh, that's actually a research area that I'm quite excited about, like how do we design good studies? Um, which is obviously something that like, cognitive scientists and so on have been looking in, uh, into for quite a while. Um, another takeaway is that interdisciplinary work is difficult um, and um, it's always important um, to reach out to a broad ensemble of specialists from other disciplines um, so we understand what the current debates are in different disciplines and are not like relying on just like one viewpoint about like what the state of the art in a different discipline is and in particular sort of it seems important not to just like rely on like one sort of like popular science or philosophy book um, uh, as a sort of summary of like what cognitive scientists think and so on. So it's important to like enter the, the debates there. Um, and then um, and I think Cooperative AI Foundation is a great platform actually to, 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 to do that and improve, improve on that. Um, and yeah, so also, I um, mean, this is something I'm going to get into a little bit when I talk about my current research. Um, uh, it seems that like using sort of a hybrid of end-to-end -end learning and algorithms with um, provable guarantees might might be um, might be the good thing to do sometimes rather than trying to learn everything end to end uh, all the time. And then um, yeah, we should maybe try to centralize cooperation problems um, whenever possible. And I will get back to that uh, a bit later because that introduces um, security um, issues. Yeah, so what's the best response to all these sort of takeaways? Um, and now we're getting back to the first slide of my talk, multi-agent security. Um, and this is, um, yeah, an uh, area, field of research, a direction and impulse um, that uh, is not just, uh, uh, yeah, it's not uh, just uh, by myself, but it's, um, it's in conjunction with uh, a lot of very talented people um, from Meta, uh, talks with um, Amazon Science Technology and um, yeah, um, some of them we are all together organizing this uh, workshop um, at Neurox. And uh, deadline is uh, October 7th, um, so you, you can still submit if you like to. And if you would like to be a reviewer for the workshop, um, let me know. Um, we're going to start reviewing um, soon after um, the deadline. We are sponsored by um, the uh, by GovAI Center for Governance of AI, um, which is very exciting. Okay, so multi-agent security, the first question we need to ask ourselves is what is security? Um, well, um, we are adopting here a very uh, general definition of security, not just cyber security, but we are adopting a definition that actually means security is um, being free from danger or threats thanks to measures that model and prevent or mitigate harmful events. Um, and that's kind of different from safety, although um, yeah, um, I think it's a. I think security was there first, then safety came, um, and now safety has um, sort of adopted um, some fields, sort of some, some aspects of security, um, and it's kind of unclear what the exact differentiation between safety and security is. Um, but security is usually thought of um, sort of in relation with in relationship to another, so some attackers, um, some some other entity that I want to share private information from. Um, and this takes different forms in different domains. So we have personal organization, uh, national security, food security, economic security, and of course also cyber security. And cyber security is mostly about protecting digital data from theft and infrastructure from um, attacks. Now, the central tenet of multi agent security is that actually security may be um, as close to a foundation of cooperation as we might get because um, and here we are starting with an analogy um, outside of the digital world. So security is, is, is usually seen as foundation of cooperation between individuals, groups, and nations. Because if security is not there, so security alone is not sufficient um, for cooperation. But if it's not there, then um, things like trust and confidence um, uh, cannot really be established. And um, security is also necessary in order to establish um, stability and predictability. Um, that then enable me to do um, uh, long-term commitments, um, which are extremely important for cooperation. Um, so if security is not there, then uh, cooperation is limited to sort of degenerate forms of cooperation almost, right? Like, um, so which, which rely on coercion or, um, um, yeah, um, or, or other very inefficient models. 
Um, yeah, and so um, this this falls, and of course, like uh, the, like yeah, this is uh, sort of um, aligned with the core of the Cooperative AI Foundation, right? Um, which is um, trying to improve the cooperative intelligence of advanced AI for the benefit of all, and um, uh, improve uh, cooperation between humans, machines, organizations. Um, and one of the issues um, that um, we see in the cooperative AI world of the future, where we have humans and institutions and um, AI agents uh, um, interact together, we had some examples here from like automated, like uh, of, of AI calling restaurants and so on. So that's just a small example of like cooperative infrastructure. But in principle, you know, we can have digital agents that are. Um, I don't know, um, managing our social interactions um, or that are negotiating deals for us and so on. So like we could see these agents as extensions of ourselves um, doing things in our name um, and expanding our personal capabilities of maintaining social contacts or carrying out jobs and so on. And um, we see already that um, the advent of such a world is opening up new AI attack surfaces, um, such for example, attack for attacks on AI input sensors, training data, um, but also humans and organizations, both physically and digitally. So privacy, of course, is, is a digital form of attack and uh, also platform infrastructure. So um, social media, social network providers and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you, if you look back at the Internet of Things, uh, which was promoted like in, in 2009, like in, around that time, we see that um, security issues have had uh, um, to, to a massive delay in the adoption of the Internet of Things. So in a sense, if you want to have this world of the future, this cooperative AI world of the future, um, we should think of security um, as, as a central thing to, to work out beforehand rather than um, uh, later, you know, when damage is already done. Um, so yeah, I've already like discussed a little bit how this work might look like. And um, so um, principles, humans organizations will be represented by advanced AI agents. Um, and these AI agents will need access to sensitive information about their principles. Um, and so the central tenet of multi-agent security is that these agents will need to enjoy the same quality of security as their principles. And they might also communicate in ways in which their principles are communicating, for example, language models and trusted uh, platform infrastructure providers um, that ensure the security um, of, of all participating agents. Um, and the design of such a platform is, is the central concern of um, multi-agent security. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, is it just this slide here? Is it just this slide here? Okay, so um, security needs in the cooperative world. So I've already talked a little bit about um, how um, this cooperative AI world might look like. Um, and it's essentially the idea is that principals, humans and organizations will be represented by advanced AI agents, right? And these AI agents will need access to sensitive information or private information of the principals and so on to be able to do their job. Um, and because these AI agents um, know sensitive information about humans, um, and also because they might be communicating and interacting like humans, for example, as language models, then the idea of multi-agent security is that the AI agents need to enjoy the same quality of security as their principles. Um, and it's not just cybersecurity, but it's also other categories of security. Um, and to ensure that, um, we need trusted platform infrastructure providers as well. And so the design of these, uh, how these infrastructure, platform infrastructure could look like um, is also a central concern of multi-agent security. Um, so multi-agent security is a fundamental systems level rethink um, of cybersecurity in the age of advanced cooperative AI. Now, when I say cybersecurity, um, I'm uh, acknowledging that cybersecurity will have aspects of other um, uh, elements of security that are usually um, um, yeah, um, assigned to humans. Um, and um, the idea is that we try to make use of the latest progress in AI in order to um, model threats in such uh, multipolar um, environment, so where we don't know who's friend, who's foe. Um, and we also want to um, find some perspective on, on threat co-evolution. So as our technology advances progress, it's very important to acknowledge that these capabilities can be used both by attackers and defenders. And so um, while technological progress is hard to predict, um, it's definitely really, really important to um, Acknowledge that 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 you know we have to think um, about this co-evolution um, ahead of time as much as possible. Um, we can we can have some sort of schematic um, 
uh, formulation of like what uh, MASEC does um, to traditional security, so in traditional sort of cybersecurity settings, or, or not just cybersecurity, but the security settings, you usually have a system and an adversary. And um, as we go to MASEC, we basically, our core cell is, uh, entails like at least five different agents, right? So we have a system, we have a principal, we have an actor, we have an adversary. The adversary might also then have an AI actor. So we already have like five agents. So it's uh, inherently, this is why we call it multi-agent security, because we inherently we have um, a whole lot of agents um, in the sort of security core cell. Um, I've already talked about multipolar security, so here the idea is that on these platforms it might not necessarily be easy to assign roles. So who's an adversary, who's a defender, who's good, who's bad, what behavior is acceptable, who makes the rules, and so on. Um, the problem is um, here that um, we don't want lock-in either, so we don't want to um, uh, have these decisions and so on um, be frozen in time, but they need to be able to co-evolve um, or to evolve over time. Um, and we need to make sure we don't oppress like minority actors. And like one example for oppression of minority actors, for example, there could be AI agents that are just have just access to much more data or compute, um, and therefore you know they might like, dominate um, uh, the sort of shared space. Um, and we don't want that. At the same time, of course, we need to make sure that like there is um, uh, protection in, in terms of like security uh, from 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 adversary attacks and so on. Um, yeah, and um, as you can see here, so Masic sort of breaks with a few assumptions that sort of traditional security um, learning um, uh, research assumes. So, for example, we don't necessarily assume that systems are equilibrium. Um, we don't necessarily assume that equilibria can be computed or otherwise tractable. Um, and we also assume that um, environments are constantly misspecified. So, so both attackers and defenders don't really know how the environment looks like, looks like, look like, and, and so constantly misspecify them. And then, of course, there's the issue of multipolarity. We don't necessarily know who is attacker or defender, um, and um, we need some ways of working out the rules for this, or so dynamically adjusting the rules, whether it be enforced uh, through the platform infrastructure or otherwise. And there's also like the cost benefit trade off. So um, we need to make sure that we can unlock the economic capabilities um, of such a such a world. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so so you know we, we, we cannot maybe you know we have to trade in um, a certain level of security um, for um, yeah against the cost that it takes to implement it. Um, yeah, and then there's also this long-term security view of like trying to anticipate threat core evolution at all time scales. So this is inherently limited, but um, there are some examples I would come to that as well, where not thinking about this um, leads us to not adopt um, measures that we could have adopted if we had asked this question. Um, yeah, so this leads to five pillars of multi-agent security, which I've um, talked about, um, and which sort of go beyond the traditional um, security setting. Um, why is this research sort of neglected? Um, well, there is sort of the impression that at least in the AI industry, we focus on direct capabilities research um, rather than issues like security by design. So the cybersecurity community, there is a lot of um, a lot of uh, thought is is uh, is, is um, present among the cybersecurity community about uh, how to mitigate against these security issues and so on. But um, there's a sort of disconnect between the cybersecurity community and the AI community there, um, because it's also about like you know moving fast, um, creating new systems capabilities, um, and reaping the economic benefits of that. Um, and that's sometimes antithetical to um, increasing the inherent security of these systems. Um, and there's also really interestingly um, um, a lot of work on sort of impossibility results, for example, the limits of privacy enhancing technologies um, that are well known in cybersecurity, but um, sort of ignored in, AI, in the AI community. So um, there's still like a lot of research surrounding privacy enhancing technologies um, that fundamentally cannot lead to um, an improvement of the system, but nevertheless, um, yeah, there's still Still, uh, still papers published uh, claiming improvements when, when they cannot um, improve. Um, yeah, and then cyber, the security community is focusing mostly on infrastructure protecting um, and, and sort of classical questions of cyber security. So yeah, bringing these both together, these both communities together is like um, something we do with the workshop as well. Yeah, and so um, we want to yeah, le leverage um, and bring together like these, these different fields um, um, to, to, yeah, um, get a more comprehensive understanding of um, what the requirements are for the sort of cooperative AI 
um, systems of the future. Um, yeah, and by doing that, also like we want to make sure that we are grounded in, in agree world settings and uh, we have sort of principal foundations. Um, and um, yeah, we, we are trying to avoid sort of ad hoc research um, on imagined settings or um, by definition unprincipled approaches because when you are talking about security, then it's quite unlikely that these, um, uh, this kind of research is going to be robust or, or relevant. Um, yeah, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about my research. I think I'm already over time, so it'll be very fast. So um, one thing is um, this uh, work on perfectly secure steganography. Um, which has been uh, featured by Scientific American and Quantum Magazine and Schneier Security Blog and so on. And steganography is this setting where uh, Alice and Bob want to communicate, but Eve is intercepting a channel. And so if Alice and Bob use cryptography, then Eve maybe can't decrypt the message, but Eve knows, oh, this is encrypted somehow. This looks like an encrypted message. So um, might get suspicious. However, if you use steganography, then um, what Alice and Bob share looks like ordinary communication. And so they have plausible deniability. And it turns out um, that's like what our project um, uh, resulted in. You can encode secret uh, messages into the output of generative AI models um, in a way that is entirely undetectable. And because we use more and more AI generated content and because deepfakes get better and better, that actually opens um, the door to um, covert communications that are undetectable. Um, yeah, so it's been an open problem to design um, uh, algorithms that are um, both efficient and perfectly secure and arbitrary cover text distributions. So that's what we solved and um, yeah, using some advances from computational statistics and empirically we find that um, we are also practically undetectable so we can crank down detectability arbitrarily um, just by basic precision of our data type and so we get like KL divergences between the cover text and stereo text distribution that are like 10 to the minus 16 or whatever or lower. Um, so we also practically undetectable. And this came from multi-agent learning. So we were looking at implicit communication in Hanabi actually. So what I said before when I said like maybe you know we should not work with rec recreation of games. Well there is still um, hope that um, some of that research because it treats fairly fundamental sort of settings were um, so motivation that maybe that's not the most um, yeah um, the most direct road um, to take um, and in fact we first um, demonstrated um, aspects a uh, variant of this algorithm in, in, in a game okay the other research I've um, so, so then I've been thinking about okay can we do um, adversary attacks on uh, reinforcement learning agents that are similarly um, undetectable and the answer is um, yes so um, in cybersecurity, um, attackers usually try to remain undetectable. In fact, um, we can do the same thing with adversarial attacks on, on reinforcement learning agents, and we get um, classes of attacks that are stronger than traditional attacks. Um, while, um, a, like, um, uh, if you fix a detectability level, information theoretically, a detectability level, then you can learn stronger attacks with our technique, much stronger attacks than conventional um, attacks can. Here's an example of a simple matrix game. We don't have time to go through this. Then here's some objective. And the interesting thing is we're trying to keep basically the um, trajectory distribution of the observed, of the unattacked observed and the attacked observed um, environment the same. It's quite a difficult um, estimation problem, but we found some, some good uh, estimators. And we can show that we can learn attacks that um, are also visually um, impossible for or hard for humans to, to detect while Existing attacks basically um, result in this sort of like jittering that you can um, see here, for example, in pendulums on the left hand side, you have a, a traditional attack on the right hand side, you have ours. Um, and yeah, so this basically means um, how can we defend from such attacks? And the answer again is um, it seems like the defense has to happen on the systems level, right? Um, we can't really detect these attacks, so we can't really enforce this like on the software level, but we have to think about how can we. Um, make sure that only authorized code is being um, executed or something in, in our cooperative environment. So this has quite a strong strong message for that as well. Um, in terms of the demo, so I'm just using the remaining uh, minus five minutes um, to talk a little bit about the demos that, that uh, I'm, I'm working on as part of the hackathon. So one is actually looking at the limits of collusion. So the idea here is 
we're setting up the simple um, classical inclusion problems. So it's like we're starting with Smallville, but we're um, restricting it a little bit. And then the idea is, um, OK, if we equip agents with the ability to perform this perfectly secure steganography um, communication, then um, how well can we um, prevent that just by, for example, paraphrasing their communication channels and so on? And then conversely, um, can we error correct? Um, against such paraphrasing attacks um, efficiently. Um, and that sort of gives, gives a limit. So if you have advanced AI agents and you're concerned that they might maliciously collude with each other, then um, if you want to prevent them to do so in an undetectable way, then um, yeah, that would give us some, some impression of whether it would make sense to just like paraphrase everything um, uh, by default. Um, for example, right? And it's also, of course, it's the same setting as um, censorship setting. So if you want to use this um, uh, technique, like with a repressive regime, maybe in Uganda or whatever, uh, you're part of the opposition, then um, yeah, could could uh, this regime take these kind of measures? And the second demo is about uh, privacy leaks and multi-agent mediation. So mediation is a super important setting um, that has found a lot of attention in economics, but not in reinforcement learning yet. And so the idea is you have a centralized mediator and agents can decide to share some of the private information, for example, the negotiation objectives or whatever with the centralized mediator. And then there are various variants of the problems and then some of which um, agents then have to commit to um, suggestions by the mediator and other ver versions you don't have, they don't have to commit to it. Um, but the idea is because the mediator is centralized um, and it has more access to more information from more different agents, um, uh, it can find a better overall solution. Now, one of the problems here is that this, the recommendations that the mediator makes um, may themselves uh, leak private information um, about the, the agents. Um, and so the question is, how can we stop this? And there's some theoretical results on large games, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of work, practical work on how to do this like in small games um, or in realistic settings. And um, yeah, so this is uh, coming to the end of my talk and um, I hope you Sounds interesting and uh, yeah, any questions? Sorry for running over slightly. Uh, that's no problem at all. Uh, only quite enjoyable indeed. Uh, thank you so much for the talk, Christian. Uh, and everyone's of course sitting at home with their clapping hands. Uh, we are at least here. Um, thank you so much. Anyone who has any questions are very welcome to raise their hand at the bottom of the screen or just write in the chat. And possibly I can, uh, I can grab some of the first questions here. So when you think of these real world issues and you want to grab hold of that with mm -hmm. Masek, uh, how do you see this relate to the problems posed at this hackathon? And what do you expect to see besides your own two cases here or your own two demos? Uh, and what might be some of the more extreme, like, oh, this will be very hard, but very interesting in the Masek uh, space? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very, very good question. Um, so I'm, I'm in general excited, so maybe talking about other people's work first. So I'm very excited about these collusion um, things that the Lewis is doing. Um, so collusion in, in other settings other than um, between like um, language models and so on, um, and how, how they can learn to establish collusion. So the setting I'm looking at is, is basically saying, okay, um, let's try to prevent undetectable collusion, right? So, but you could have other settings where maybe you are okay with collusion being detectable somehow because you're confident that, I don't know, you, you're exchanging so little, like nobody's going to basically have a detector or something, right? Um, so I find that really interesting how collusion can arise end to end and so on. Um, in terms of uh, my demos, um, uh, my proposed demos, and what I would love to see is, um, yeah, some sort of way for, so, so for the um, for the mediator um, demo, I, I would like to see some sort of solution where we are um, um, asking some sort of iterated commitment from agents. So it's basically like we make some, the mediator makes some initial proposal or something that is that is not very detailed, um, but then sort of like, you know, um, agents have to commit to stay within the boundaries of that proposal before then the mediator is going to make um, more detailed suggestions. So it's basically like you, um, you reveal um, and you reveal solutions iteratively, but um, you need agents to commit first to a sort of, and I think in, in, in the real world we do this by having, um, I know the word in German, but it's sort of like um, you have you have sort of um, rough contract, coarse contracts, um, where you fix like sort of general, like 
course terms of the agreement and then you work out the details later and I think this is what might happen there so it'd be nice to see that um, and then in the steganography example yeah it's just really interesting to see how much um, capacity do we have for communication do we actually have when um, when when you know I'm paraphrasing my communication channels and um, how does paraphrasing maybe interfere with our ability to um, to to uh, to do the uh, sort of overt completely overt tasks so in Smallville for example can we still um, plan our Valentine's Day party if we are being paraphrased all the time, um, you know, and, and then, yeah, of course, like, you know, how well can we ever correct for this if we, like, invert the paraphrasing model somehow to try to infer what, what was actually sent, yeah. So it's, it's yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that because it could be sort of a principal solution to, yeah, nice. pollution yeah, did, angst. Did you see the recent work on contracts between, like, reinforcement learning agents with... LLMs. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen, yeah. I've seen, yeah, yeah. So um, that goes in that direction too. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And Smallville, by the way, uh, for anyone unaware, is uh, as far you can correct me, Christian, uh, but is the like mm -hmm. naturalistic environment for a bunch of agents living in a village together and uh, doing a bunch of natural actions such as uh, organizing a Valentine's party or something like this. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's very cute. <laughs> yeah. All right, we don't see any questions coming from the audience mm -hmm. here. Um, you're still very welcome to raise your, your hands here, and we can invite you to the stage. Otherwise, I'm curious, uh, you mentioned shortly the censorship avoidance um, mm -hmm. using this method. Um, do you see, so, so we of course are quite interested in these risks of multi-agent uh, systems, mm. right? But do you see some mm. of the, uh, with Masik, some of the, the ways to, to avoid this in, in human social scenarios where there is some sort of value lock in, in a society or something that, for example, dictatorships or North Korea, something like this, where it's actually useful to, to be able to circumvent, uh, it might be a bit of a, a, a big work question, um, but yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, so, so from, a, from a security researcher's point of view, cybersecurity researcher's point of view, it's, um, um, I mean, in order to use this perfectly secure steganography, you need to have an app that can actually do this, um, and your app needs to be installed on some sort of device that you have access to. Um, so if you're in a very, very oppressive regime, like Chinese government or whatever, they probably have ways to prevent you from um, installing such an app or they might even have sort of bait apps or whatever that if you install them you go to prison um, and um, so there are other settings um, in maybe less oppressive societies um, like um, for example Uganda I've been mentioning us on where there is and the opposition is at risk but the secret service is not as powerful um, so it could potentially be more useful there um, having said that, um, there is, of course, there are of course countermeasures. You can, there is, there's research on like hiding apps on on phones and so on. And then, uh, you know, so it, it, again, it's like a, you never get around this like fundamental. So it can, but it can be, it can be. Um, I think it, it can be an interesting and part of the tool chain, particularly when it comes to end to end encryption regulation. For example, like it could be a way to um, use stronger encryption than you're legally allowed to without being, you know, detectable. For example, yeah. so. Um, it's it's interesting. So there there are there are uh, uses for that, but um, yeah, yeah. We always have to think about the whole sort of um, security problem. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I'm I'm curious. Uh, now I'm just taking over the questions. Uh, of mm. course, anyone's welcome to jump in. Um, I'm curious when it comes to these mediation environments or these mediation games mm. or what you might call it. Uh, mm. Have you looked at also how? Like mediators between, for example, Israel and Egypt work with this with these sorts of situations in terms of information asymmetries and, and whatnot. Mediators between, I didn't didn't quite hear between uh, between, who? for example, Israel and Egypt. I know they have like oh you and okay the international mediators. yeah yeah international politics yeah I mean um, yeah, so again it's really hard to 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 model because like very often this is about individual relationships between decision makers and trusted uh, mediators and so on so trust is very important but like it's um it's less of a it's not as transactional as you would think and then there's a lot of signaling going on where like you don't really know what was agreed uh, behind the scenes but um you know because because you signal to your domestic audiences uh in international negotiations so 
um, yeah, it's 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 very hard. So I wouldn't take this as, as sort of the prime motivating example. I would say it's more useful for I don't know um, sort of market situations or, or things like this. Yeah. Yeah. Or conflict sense. resolution maybe in social media, social networks, something. Yeah. Yeah. So simpler mediation environments, I guess. And yeah, simpler mediation environments, but but certainly like you know we there, there are, there's research looking into application to to um, yeah politics and so on. But uh, yeah, as I said, like you know I think that there are a lot of other factors at play there. So I don't know. Maybe like mergers and acquisitions, probably these kinds of <laughs> things. You know, I think I think this could be very useful. Where it's more like evolving information overload and. Yeah, um, yeah. sifting through that information, um, yeah. Putting information in information escrow or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah it, just the last question here that we are we are running over the hour here. Um, but now that people are sitting here listening to this talk during a great hackathon where we are trying to find failure cases, uh, even though you say, oh, these game environments, these simple environments might not be representative. Uh, are there some, uh, some game environments or some sort of uh, simple uh, implementations uh, where where you can see pretty big potential in showing and showcasing these risks. Um, well, it's always a trade-off between like you know what can we do in, in the little time that we have, and so if we can show some analogy of some bigger problem that then helps people understand like what this problem is about um, on some level, then that might be because like I think the hackathon like I think is. Uh, Ultimately aimed at decision makers, um, and so you know it might be might be might be useful nevertheless. Um, yeah. Yeah. Even even if you're not in a particularly realistic environment. Um, yeah. Yeah. So even if it might not be academically generalizable, it is lay people or policymaker generalizable. <laughs> Could be as long as you you apply terms and conditions, right? Yeah. Like that's always the issue. Like if you overstate the relevance, then. Um, yeah, maybe there should be one in the, in the project template, a little terms and conditions done. <laughs> exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Um, yeah, again, like, you know, like, like not everything is a prison cell level, for example. Um, yeah. Hardly anything is really, and if you get that wrong, you know, you can you can really make wrong policy decisions sometimes. So, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. All right. All right. Thank cool. you so much, Christian. And thank you to thank the you. people joining us, both here and uh, online on YouTube. Um, yeah, I'll end the stream here, but uh, thank you everyone for joining and uh, good luck with all of your projects. Thank you. Bye-bye, Aspen. Ciao, ciao.